Our New Testament reading this morning is from the Gospel according to Luke. In Luke's Gospel, this is the beginning of Jesus' call to his disciples. We begin at chapter 5, verse 1. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let your nets down for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. So also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Holy wisdom, holy word. Have you ever wondered why exactly the disciples followed Jesus? I wonder about it every time we share these stories, the stories of the early encounters between Jesus and the ones we know will eventually follow him. When he meets them, of course, they're doing other things. Mostly, they're fishermen, at least seven of the original 12. One's a tax collector. One is politically engaged enough that we know him by his party, Simon the Zealot. The others, we don't know. And they all have their lives, their families, their siblings, their parents, wives, children. They all have their responsibilities as men, the ancient traditional job of providing for the family. So why do they follow? What's so compelling about Jesus? How can they just leave everything? We have four Gospels that tell us these stories, and each of them has their own lens. In the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, Jesus sees fishermen, Simon, not the zealot, and his brother, Andrew, and they're cleaning their nets, and he says, follow me, and they do, just like that. In the Gospel of John, Andrew meets Jesus first and brings Simon back to meet him, at which point Jesus promptly changes Simon's name to Peter, and they become part of Jesus' retinue. Done. Why? Why do they do it? How can they leave their obligations so easily? You might even think carelessly. But today we're in the Gospel of Luke, and the call of Simon, who is eventually known as Simon Peter, and then Peter, is different here. And it begins not with this story, but one that takes place a little earlier. 
When last we saw Jesus, last week, he was making his way through a hostile crowd that wanted to throw him off a cliff. Remember? He heads from there to the synagogue in Capernaum where he teaches, he heals a man, and he is warmly received. Everyone loves him. He leaves the synagogue and goes to the home of Simon, not the zealot. And in this gospel, that's the first time we hear that name. And this is the first occasion on which we meet this person. How did Jesus and Simon meet? Did Jesus simply pick his home out at random and present himself at the door? Did Simon hear Jesus' sermon in the synagogue and invite him home to supper? We don't know. When Jesus gets to Simon's house, the people bring Simon's mother-in-law to Jesus' attention. She is suffering from a fever, and Jesus' reputation as a healer is growing. Jesus rebukes the fever, and it leaves her, and immediately she gets up from her sickbed and begins to serve the family and guests. Because Jesus is getting that reputation now for teaching and healing, of course, this draws people to him. As the sun was setting, it says, all those who had any who were sick with various kinds of diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on each of them and cured them. The next day, Jesus is off again, proclaiming the good news, that agenda God has set out for him, the agenda we've been talking about now for a few weeks, freedom, healing, and hope. This brings us to today's story, chapter 5. Jesus is standing by the lake, which the Gospels also call the Sea of Galilee. The crowds are growing larger and larger, and Jesus, in an attempt to be able to be heard by all, but also maybe to establish a little personal space around himself, decides to get into a boat, Simon's boat. And he asks him to put out from shore, And then he sits down and he begins to teach the crowds who are all standing on shore, looking out at him. What do you think might be going through Simon's head? What is he thinking? I mean, let's imagine, okay, maybe he heard Jesus in the synagogue, which would mean he also witnessed a healing there. And then he brought Jesus back to his home, let's just say. And there, Simon saw him heal his own mother-in-law. And then, as the sun set, all the people they brought to him with all kinds of illnesses and diseases. It's clear that the people, these anxious crowds, with their desperate and their ill, can't get enough of Jesus. His words and his healing touch. And now Peter's boat is a kind of floating pulpit for Jesus, and he's teaching these enormous crowds, and the crowds keep growing. Is Simon thinking, this is great, this is so exciting? Or maybe, why do I keep running into this guy? Or even, what am I doing? What is happening to my life? This is getting out of hand. Or maybe some confusing combination of all of these. Eventually, of course, Jesus' teaching comes to an end and he turns to Simon and says, put out into deep water. Let down your nets for a catch. Simon answers Jesus and one specific word he uses is very revealing. Note how Simon addresses Jesus. In the Greek, the original language this gospel was written in, it's the word epistata. And that translates to the term, in our translation, master. Which anyone who's grown up in the U.S. and knows our history, we can very quickly connect with words like slave master and task master. But it's also used elsewhere in the Bible to mean commander or officer in a military context, overseer in a church context. It's the word that eventually turns into episcopal. Teacher, as in schoolmaster, 
or even doctor. This one word is translated in this myriad of ways. But it is revealing because it tells us how Simon is thinking about Jesus. He sees Jesus as one in charge, certainly, a teacher and a healer, someone to defer to. So despite the miserable night of fishing, Simon does lower the nets, and you know what happens. He catches some fish, not just some fish, a lot, an enormous amount, so many that the nets are strained to the breaking point, so many that the two men in Simon's boat can't haul the catch in themselves, so have to get help from another boat with two men in it. So many that the four have to bring in this stunning payload. So many that both boats begin to sink in that deep water. And did you notice suddenly at this point in the passage, we're calling Simon, Simon Peter. His name is already changing. Simon Peter, when the enormity of this catch, the uncanny, impossible abundance of what has just happened, dawns on him, when it sinks in, he falls to his knees. He falls at Jesus' feet. And then he says, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Now, now, For Simon Peter, Jesus is not master or commander or overseer or teacher, but Lord. Lord, the one with the power. Lord, meaning the one to whom we kneel, not because we are pushed to our knees, but because we fall to our knees in wonder, in awe. In the presence of power, we know is unimaginable. What do you suppose is going through Simon Peter's head now? He says, go away from me. He says, I am not worthy to be in your presence. Our text says, for he and all who were with him were amazed by what had just happened. And that includes the other man in Simon's boat, probably his brother Andrew, The brothers in the other boat, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they're all amazed. We overuse that word, amazed. I think I might say it ten ten times a day, easily. In the original language, this phrase is much more powerful. It says, awe engulfed them. Awe engulfed them. They all knew they were in a different kind of deep water with this Jesus. There was no mistaking it. And then Jesus says something we usually hear from angelic messengers in the Bible, which also makes sense because their presence also tends to engulf people in awe, swamps them in the deep waters of mystery. He says, do not be afraid. And then he adds a tantalizing prediction, or maybe it's an invitation. From now on, You will be catching people. I wonder what Simon Peter and the others think of that statement. Does it mystify them? Does it confuse them? Are they a little put off by it? Something I read this week pushed me to hear this in a different way. People who fish know that some fish swim near the surface. Others live in deeper waters. Those who fish with a pole use bait to attract a certain kind of fish and are usually only able to catch one fish at a time. But those who use nets dip them into the water and haul in an abundant catch. Fish of all sizes and varieties. The fish that are highly prized for flavor as well as the slimy bottom feeders the fish whose scales shimmer, and the fish that are spiny. Some of these fish are tastier than others, but all are hauled in. When you fish with nets, you cannot pick and choose what you catch. You pull up everything. 
And it's the same in Christ's community. The catch is abundant and includes everyone. Why do these men leave everything behind? Everything. Wives and children, mothers and mothers-in-law, boats and nets and daily catches to go off with Jesus? Is it possible the awe-engulfing, not to mention boat-swamping, catch of fish enables Simon and Andrew and James and John to just begin to know Jesus a little, to understand what he's about, to understand in a way maybe that only fishermen could. Do they see in the magnificent catch of fish something they long to be caught up into? Some notion, some Recognition, perhaps, that no matter where they fall on the scale of shimmering to spiny, they long to be found in the deep waters fished by Christ. That they see in him healing for their hurts and wisdom for their hearts beyond loss, beyond cost, beyond anything they've known before. And what about us? What does God ask us to leave behind so that we might be a part of the great catch? What holds us back from saying, yes, Lord, here I am, Lord? What beauty in those deep waters calls to us and says, follow me? Thanks be to God. Amen.